now honored to introduce Dr. Bernice King, who will introduce our keynote speaker today, who will be in conversation with Reggie McKnight. And let's give a hand to Dr. King, please. Thank you so much, John. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I am honored to introduce a truly extraordinary human being, someone very dear to my heart, my Uncle Andy, or as the world knows him, Ambassador Andrew J. Young, who has earned worldwide recognition as a pioneer in and true champion of civil and human rights. Andrew Jackson Young Jr.'s journey began with a profound commitment to justice and equality grounded in faith. From his early days as an ordained minister in Thomasville, Georgia, to community organized and activists who served alongside my father, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as a lieutenant during the pivotal moments of the civil rights movement, Andrew Young dedicated his life to the noble cause of redeeming the soul of America. He was a key strategist and negotiator during the civil rights movement that led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. His lifelong dedication to service is illustrated by his extensive leadership experience of over 65 years, which included a career as a public official spanning multiple sectors. He is one of a few who served in all three branches of government, seamlessly transitioning between the executive, federal, and local levels as the first U black U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, the first black U.S. congressman from Georgia since Reconstruction, and the second black mayor of Atlanta. As ambassador, Andrew Young negotiated an end to white minority rule in Namibia and Zimbabwe and brought President Jimmy Carter's emphasis on human rights to international diplomacy efforts. As a two-term mayor of this great city of Atlanta, he brought in over 1,100 businesses, over 70 billion in foreign direct investments, and generated over a million jobs. He was instrumental in Atlanta's rise as an international city. His visionary leadership not only shaped the trajectory of Atlanta, but also left an indelible mark on global affairs uniting nations during the Olympics. Today, Andrew Young stands as one of the architects of modern Atlanta, a beacon of compassion, inspiration, and resilience. After his public life, his passion for human rights fueled his extensive work to drive sustainable economic development in the business sectors um, of, of nations in the black diaspora spanning the Caribbean and Africa through Good Works International. He also leveraged his unparalleled, unparalleled wisdom to provide counsel to world leaders and corporate executives to facilitate, facilitate global trade. His involvement in the nonviolent movement combined with his keen understanding of global affairs has made him one of the most sought after thought leaders on building strong diplomatic relations between nations and between nations and their citizens. Many prestigious boards are blessed to have him as a member we count it an honor to have him as our longest serving board member at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change, the King Center where I serve as the CEO. He has served since our founding in 1968, 56 years. That's a long time. <laughs> Almost my age. <laughs> Following his retirement from Goodwill, he founded Good Works, excuse me. He founded the Andrew J. Young Foundation with his wife, Carolyn, in 2003, and currently serves as its chair. Uh, the Young Foundation is dedicated to supporting education, health, leadership, and human rights in the United States, the Caribbean, and the continent of Africa. One of his greatest joys that he talks about quite a big bit is the work that is done to educate, equip, and empower young people through the Southwest YMCA named after him and his brother, Walter Young. He is a husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. And in, in the aftermath of my father's assassination, Andrew Young became a steadfast, steadfast pillar of strength for my mother, Coretta Scott King, my siblings, and me. He was always there. 
his unwavering support further embedded him in my heart and the hearts of my siblings as Uncle Andy. Not only is Uncle Andy, not only is he Uncle Andy, but to me he is hands down one of the best storytellers of all time. <laughs> And today, we have an opportunity to partake of the breadth of his knowledge, the depth of his wisdom, and the, and the compassion of his soul. My brothers and sisters, let's welcome my Uncle Andy, Ambassador Andrew Jackson Young, Jr., a New Orleanian by birth and an Atlantan by choice. Amen. Let's get started because Ambassador Young can be a little shy, so I want to make sure that I don't put him um, on the spot today. But good afternoon, everyone. Um, walking on the stage, I said a little prayer because look at this room. What other city in the country can you go in at lunch and have a conversation with Ambassador Andrew Young, Dr. Bernice King, Senator Sam Nunn, and so many amazing business leaders. You know, Ambassador Young, I've had the chance over the last three years to sit with you probably every other week. Um, and it's been truly a blessing. And so every time I'm with you, I just say, thank you, God, for this opportunity. Now, Atlanta. The world got to visit Atlanta last night, thanks to Usher. <laughs> the world will be coming here through the World Cup next year. And only in Atlanta could you have a room packed with so many distinguished leaders who've not only made history, but continue to lead us into the future. So my question for you, Ambassador Young, is how did Atlanta become this? Well, let me first of all say that this young man is a friend of mine that uh, I realized uh, came here with Google but um, I knew him, uh, of him, as the captain of the Notre Dame soccer team, uh, and who later went on to Duke uh, to get his graduate degree, and now is some big shot with Google here. <laughs> and uh, he's the kind of people we like coming to town. <laughs> uh, but. This room wasn't here, but it was a room like this that I like to say it's a room where it happened. Uh, sometime, somewhere in one of these rooms in Atlanta, before I got here, um, while Martin Luther King was still in Montgomery, uh, Beaufort Jones of the Woodrow Foundation, uh, a lady by the name of uh, Helen Bullard that you may or may not have ever heard of, uh, Ivan Allen, uh, and I don't know where Sam Massell was or um, Dan Sweat. But out of that group, somehow, came a little pamphlet that was called The Atlanta Way, The Making of Modern Atlanta. And I got a hold of that paper when I got here. And it had things like to develop a mass transit system, to have uh, international, well, it, at that time it was just a national airport. Uh, and uh, it was a dream list, interstate highways, because uh, uh, 75, 85 right down here was not 
It was just a four lane narrow, beat up road. Uh, and uh, this was a big dream. But I don't think it could have happened if on the other side of town, uh, John Wesley Dobbs, Jesse, Jack, uh, Jesse Hill, uh, Herman Russell, uh, and uh, can't remember her name, uh, but she was in the state legislature and she helped to draw, redraw the lines uh, for the congressional district that allowed me to get elected. Uh, but then she voted for my, my opponent. <laughs> uh, who was a friend of hers in the legislature. She happened to be a black woman. Uh, Grace Hamilton with the Urban League. And somehow these two groups got together. Had they not gotten together, we probably wouldn't have the Atlanta we know now. Because when they came together, the chamber and uh, Rotary Clubs and everybody that uh, was dreaming and thinking needed the other side. And uh, Mayor Hartsfield lost the election, I think about 1940 something, for buying the land for the airport for $90,000, I think. Uh, putting up red lights on Peachtree Street. Uh, and there was one other unforgivable sin, <laughs> which cost him his election. Well, that split the city wide open. And it was Grace Hamilton that went to uh, Ivan Allen that took him to uh, Atlanta University complex out there and said, look, you can't do this white people alone or black people alone. This can only happen if, it ha if we get together. And that's when I think the Atlanta way got its, its, its start. And um, I don't know who chose the solution. I like to think of Helen Bullard uh, because it's always a woman in the background coming up with something brilliant. <laughs> And us men take credit for it. <laughs> and the, the, she was on the Community Relations Commission with me at the suggestion, she suggested me to uh, Sam Marcel. Uh, and uh, one of the things she said to me, she said, Andy, I've been watching you. And he said, she, she said, I think I know what makes you work. I said, please tell me. She said, you treat everybody like they're better than they really are. Mm. And I said, you know, that's pretty good. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> but I'm saying that that was the group that put in two loan executives from Coca-Cola and IBM that organized the city block by block to pass MARTA, mass transit system. Uh, Beaufort Jones put together the Atlanta Economic Opportunity Commission uh, as the chairman and the vice chairman was Martin Luther King Sr. and Calvin Craig, the Grand Klegel of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and they were the ones that organized Atlanta block by block mm -hmm. and made it possible for us to uh, pass the mass transit referendum. 
But we wouldn't have passed the mass transit referendum if uh, Jesse Hill hadn't gotten with Manuel Maloof and they went to uh, Sam Massell together and we agreed that, well, back then everybody said they just want to build this mass transit system so white folk in Buckhead can get to the airport. Uh, and they'll never build the east-west line. So they decided to build the east-west line first. And um, black folk said, you're going to tax us, and it'll be 10 years before we get a ride on a thing. So Sam Marcel lowered the bus fare from 55 cents a ride to 15 cents for 10 years to be fair to poor people. Uh, and we had an Atlanta formula that really was put together. Bofele Jones and the Woodrow Foundation, well, they were the ones that eventually came into all the money uh, that endowed everything in this town, and they want to brag, don't want to brag about it. But I think we need to know about it that there is a corporate foundation to the social progress that we've made. And if it had not been agreed to by a broad base of the business community, if, for instance, uh, and I saw Herman Russell's son come in, and uh, I saw... Uh, Oh, I saw three people come in the room. I haven't seen anybody, any of the Portmans yet. But Portman and Sam Marcel, not, not Sam Marcel, Ben Marcel, uh, and uh, they, they built the first building right down there on Peachtree, which is the... Uh, it ended up being the Atlanta Apparel Mart, mm -hmm. uh, which brings people from all over the world uh, to shop four times a year. And that four times a year means that we have the equivalent of two Super Bowls each year and no football present. <laughs> uh, so, all of this stuff came together, and it was all well-meaning people who, uh, who were willing to run the risk of working together and bringing the community together and including everybody. Uh, and I think that Atlanta formula and that list of 13 things that Sam that uh, Dan Sweat put together mm -hmm. as the um, Chamber of Commerce uh, th that's how we got here. When, uh, when I came here and ran for Congress it, um, it was because nobody else wanted to run. <laughs> and I didn't want to run either. Uh, but um, you opened your homes. Many people here, I met in 1970 when somebody was pushing me to run for Congress and I, 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 really, I, I really didn't think it was possible. But there were believers around the corner everywhere I went. Yeah. And it was in the corporate community, but it was also the women getting off the martyr buses downtown uh, that when I was out there asking them to vote for me, they started hugging me and kissing me. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it uh, we got together on something. That was... I finally got elected in 1972, and it was a pouring down rain 
we only had one day to vote. And I think Sam Michelle, I mean, Sam uh, Nunn and I got elected on that same day. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know why, but when we got to Congress, Sam was in the Senate and I was in the House and they were electing a parliamentary exchange with Japan. And um, who ended up on the tr as representatives of the U.S. Congress but Sam Massell and Andy Young. I mean, Sam Nunn and Andy Young. And I think that's where we started welcoming people uh, to bring business into Georgia. Uh, and the first international uh, investment, and then Governor Busby uh, and Pre President Carter and Lester Maddox um, all kind of got the notion that uh, we didn't have to do business alone, mm -hmm. that Georgia was the best place in the world to grow a business. And I remember going to Germany and uh, saying to people, look, you all are outproducing Europe. You can't grow your business if you stick to Europe. The only way you're going to be in business in the 21st century is to come to the United States. And the best way to get in the United States and serve everybody in the United States is to be in Atlanta. Because we're building an airport that uh, you'll be able to get to 80% of the United States in two hours. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, Mayor Hartsfield lost the election because he invited Delta here. <laughs> Which means that the majority of the people were wrong back then. <laughs> because the best thing that's happened to us, Delta and Coca-Cola, you know, made us whatever, whatever we are, they got, got us started. And then IBM and now Google and everybody else is coming in. And it's that spirit that I think kicked us off. But that's too long, forgive me. No, 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 no. John gave me four quarters, that's quarter one. <laughs> I, I wanna double click on a notion that you brought up, a, a thread about building bridges um, and, and connecting people. Particularly um, at this moment in time where um, there seems to be a lot of divisiveness, uh, there seems to be a lot of turmoil in that we're having to recross bridges that we thought had already been crossed. And so I want to dub on, double click on that notion for a minute. And, and as Dr. King uh, said, you know, you've been one of the folks who've really helped revive the soul of this nation. So looking at where Atlanta has been and how Atlanta got started, how do we now continue to build bridges to keep Atlanta moving forward? Just keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, and uh, when, when, when we were going pretty good in 60 and 61, um, there were about 60 bombings of black people's homes in Birmingham. I don't remember ever seeing it in the papers over here. In fact, even when Martin Luther King went to Birmingham and was in jail and it was all over the world, it was only on page 36 of the Birmingham Post Herald. Hmm. So we weren't getting the news of what was happening outside the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But in a way, Fred Shuttlesworth coming here saying, look, I, my church has been bombed three times. This nonviolence you preaching uh, is all right, but it can't be, it's too passive right now. We have to have a more aggressive form of nonviolence. And uh, Martin said, well, we'll be glad to help you, but there's an election coming up and um, we probably shouldn't start until after the election. That'll be March sometime. And he turned to me, he said, Andy, you know any white folks in Birmingham? I said, no, I, I grew up in New Orleans. I haven't even been to Birmingham. He said, well, you got two months to find some. 
I said, why me? He said, well, you, you know, it's got to be somebody. You don't want to send Jose. <laughs> I mean, Jose was angry because Jose, uh, Jose joined the Second World War uh, as, at 16 because going to war was the only place he could legally kill white people. And he was, I mean, he was literally hostile. Uh, and um, he never killed anybody. Uh, and he was a big, lovable guy. But, but he was, he, he had, he, and I, I, I mean, I grew, up in, I grew up in a neighborhood in New Orleans that blessed me for everything I've done. There was an Irish grocery store on one corner, an Italian bar on another. The Nazi party was on the third corner with flying swastikas. My daddy was a dentist in the middle of the block, and most of his uh, suppliers were Jewish. And so every day I got a lesson on whatever was going on in the world uh, just by listening to my neighbors and looking at what was going on on my street and playing with the children of those places. So uh, I, was, I guess I was the one to go to uh, meet the white folks. <laughs> and, uh, but again, I had been to a conference in Michigan and I remember the delegation from Alabama and they were from the Episcopal Church. So I called the Episcopal Diocesan House and um, the lady who I met in Michigan answered the phone. She was the director of Christian education and I asked her if she could help me set up a meeting between Dr. King and the Archbishop um, of the uh, Episcopal Diocese and bring together a business group like we had here in Birmingham before we started any demonstrations. Mm. Because we wanted them to know why we were demonstrating. Incidentally, we also had the people in Birmingham, and Birmingham in like Atlanta, doesn't have a whole bunch of college educated folk, but they wrote something called the Birmingham Manifesto, mm -hmm. which was simple grievances of ordinary working class black folk in, in uh, uh, Birmingham. When we started demonstrating, we had already had two or three meetings between Dr. King and Reverend Mabinathy, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and the business community. Uh, and uh, the black folk had written their manifesto, and they just wanted things like not to have to drink at water fountains, label white and black. Uh, no such thing as black water or white water. You know, just drink water. <laughs> and they, they were upset because black women had to wear smocks. Uh, and uh, the cute little girls from Auburn and Alabama came in on their vacations a few months a year uh, and they were able to dress up in the fancy dresses that were selling and uh, and they got a commission and so we said that just isn't fair let the black women dress up too and give them a commission they know more about the stores than your wife ask your wife who does she call when she wants something out of your store she doesn't call you because you don't know she doesn't call these kids, they just got here for Auburn. She calls the black women in smocks. Let them wear dresses and pay them a commission on sales. That's just good business. Well, the things that we did, well, very simple, pragmatic things like that, but we negotiated them and discussed them with about 80 black, 80 businessmen and about 20 black folk. So the whole while we were marching, you never saw that going on. But John Kennedy sent uh, Burke Marshall uh, down to sort of preside over that. And what we were really doing in Birmingham was laying the foundation for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So Birmingham business community agreed to desegregate Birmingham in June and the bill didn't come up 
in Congress till a year later, in, Ju in July 4th. And so we were exporting the Atlanta way, but now bringing it up to date, our lawyer was a young fellow by the name of Derek Bell from the NAACP. And he took this black manifesto from Birmingham and he took it to Harvard when he went to Harvard. And he wrote a book about it and called it critical race theory. <laughs> so critical race theory didn't come from Harvard. It came from poor black folk, steel workers and coal miners and farmers in Birmingham who were sitting down writing what was wrong. And so uh, the Atlanta influence ha had swept the South, swept the nation, and then Jimmy Carter comes along. And um, he, uh, he says, if this is good enough for us, why isn't it good enough? Yeah. Why, why, why don't we have a treaty with the Panamanians on the Panama Canal? We shouldn't be fighting with them. And uh, Israel and Egypt really don't want to go to war. Uh, and he took, that also is the Atlanta way. And he, he took it to, on a national level. And he sent me to Africa to do the same thing with black and white folk in Africa. Well, I knew all the white folk in, in South Africa because the Atlanta Open tennis tournament was promoted by the same guy that promoted the South African Open. Mm -hmm. And Arthur Ashe won the Atlanta Open and he invited him to come to South Africa. And um, we encouraged him to go. And he said, well, you come on, go with me. Well, they didn't want, we didn't want to be segregated, so they put us in the government box. So for a whole week while they were talking tennis, and while everybody's playing tennis, all of the Africanas that were keeping Mandela and them in jail were talking to us in, in the government box. Mm. And, and they would, when I went to see the meanest, in fact, that's why I asked, I said, who's the meanest SOB you got here? <laughs> and they gave me his name and I won't repeat it. But when I got there, he had seen a movie that Procter and Gamble made on my campaign with Rodney Cook. And the first, I mean, the first, he didn't even say hello. He said, why did white people vote for you? You know. And, and uh, I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I said, I was surprised. <laughs> uh, I said, but I said, you know, we've been doing things. We've been getting along. And I said, I, I, I had known this fellow because he was one of the people who was against the, the wall that somebody built to try to keep us from moving into pa Cascade. And, and um, he, he was good white folks. Uh, and... Uh, but he was concerned, but I was aware of the fact that when I got to South Africa in 1973, they already had a copy of the film that Procter and Gamble made in Atlanta in 1972. And they had seen it in South Africa and they were looking at, uh, they want, and I said to him, Look, I'm here because President Carter, who grew up in a county that's 80% black, mm -hmm. and he learned to get along with black folk, and they do very well, and in fact, they even help elect him president. <laughs> and he said that he would be glad to personally help you work out any problems you have in trying to end uh, apartheid here in South Africa. And he grunted. But when I left, he called the White House and talked to President Carter. And Mondale started talking about, uh, I'm saying, all this came out of Atlanta. Uh, and then we brought it back for the Olympics. <laughs> but that's the reason we could get it back for the Olympics, because you had Camp David, you had Panama Canal, mm -hmm. uh, you had all of Southern Africa, 
Um, my daughter was at Swarthmore and the president of Swarthmore had been on the doubles tennis team at Swarthmore with the guy who was the ambassador to the UN from Russia. And so he said that, you know, you all need to get to know each other. And he and I, the Russian ambassador, and I got to play tennis. We played tennis once a month. Um, and, um, and we never had a conflict. I never had a Russian veto. Yeah. Uh, when the Chinese came in to the UN, everybody was intimidated and they started talking about uh, Chinese food. And the Chinese ambassador got disgusted and Jean, my wife, was sitting over by herself because she was disgusted too. And she, he came over and said to her, where you find good Georgia food? And she said, only at my house. <laughs> when are you coming to dinner? And we had, you know, we had 20 Chinese ambassadors there in the Waldorf. And her mama came up from Alabama with greens and corn off the cob out of her garden. She got somebody to slow smoke some ribs and she fried chicken in the Waldorf. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it uh, and, and, and they came in. And Charlie Loudermilk said, I said, what do you serve? Chinese drink a lot? He said, tell them, serve mint juleps. Mm -hmm. And so I, I said, what's a mint julep? He said, they know at the Waldorf. So when they came in, they had these little silver couplets, which taste like sweet tea, but had quite a kick to it. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time they got through eating, my grandma was, my mother-in-law's fried chicken and the greens and the ribs and everything else. We never had a veto the whole time I was with the, <laughs> with the Chinese. And, and I'm saying that, and this is the room where it happened. Mm -hmm. Folk getting together, mm -hmm. just being folk. Yeah. Getting to know each other, going to dinner later on. Uh, children going to the same schools, uh, trying to keep those schools quality up, whether they're public or private. And um, so, let me ask you this. I'm doing the math a little bit. You've been in the public spotlight, what, 65, 70 years. You, you have to be the most recognizable person in Atlanta. Probably the most handsome, too. Thank um, you. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful tie you have on as well. Um, but for all the folks in this room, this distinguished group of, of business leaders, and all of us are sitting here um, because of you because of Senator Nunn, because of Dr. Bernice King, um, and our condolences to your family, Dr. King. What's one thing you don't think people in this room know about you? There's a whole lot they don't know about <laughs> me, thank God. Now John, our first interview together was three hours, so we're just getting started, okay? <laughs> no, I mean, really, I try to get to know and understand people. And in the process of getting to know and understand other people, mm -hmm. they get to understand me. Yeah. And, and, and it's not, I don't know what they know about me and it almost doesn't matter. Because when, when we get down to solving problems, it works better when we're not personally involved. You know, when, when we're not asking, what do you think and what do you want? And we say, what is right for Atlanta? Well, you know, God is still on the throne. 
<laughs> and the fact that I was born next 50 yards from the Nazi party when I was four years old in 1936, walking by the Nazi party headquarters, my dad is trying to explain to me why they're flying this swastika. And he decided that he was going to take me to the movie, a segregated movie, to see the 1936 Olympics and Jesse Owens and the, won the 100 meters. Hitler was supposed to present him with the medal. Hitler was a white supremacist. He got mad because Jesse won and he stormed out with all of his stormtroopers. Uh, and my daddy said, now watch Jesse. I said, he's not doing anything. He said, that's the point. He said, he did not pay any attention to Hitler. His job is to win three more races. And he said, you don't get mad and you don't get emotional about other people's problems. You stay calm and stay cool and do the best that you can. And Jesse Owens won three gold, more, more gold, four gold medals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he always reminded me, remember, uh, Jesse Owens kept his mind on breaking the record. He didn't worry about what anybody thought of him. And it was, his motto was that he probably repeated to me, you know, 15, 20 times a day, don't get mad, get smart. If you lose your temper in a fight, you lose the fight. And um, so I was hooked on the Olympics at, 19, at, at four years old. When Billy Payne came, I also heard my grandmama say somewhere that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. I said, damn, <laughs> this white boy had a heart attack at 32 and he got involved with the Dunwoody Presbyterian Church and he agreed to chair the fundraiser to build a new sanctuary. And he realized that it was the first time he'd done anything other than he was a football player at Georgia and made a lot of money in real estate. But this was for somebody else. This was for something not himself. And he said he had never felt that good about himself. He goes home and turns on the television and there's somebody's done a film about 17 days of glory and it's the Olympics. And he turns to his wife, Martha, and says, I wonder if we could bring the Olympics to Atlanta. And she says, you're crazy. <laughs> and everybody else thought he was crazy till he finally got Charlie Battle and a bunch of folk uh, that, uh, I can't remember all the names, but there were about six or seven of us. And he came to see me what I think. Well, going back to my four years old, I mean, I was on a track team, swimming team. I always dreamed of being an Olympian, was never good enough. Uh, and uh, so I said, I believe we can bring the Olympics here. And I looked down the list, Maggie Womack found a list. And when I checked off the list of 85 countries that had a vote, because of the UN and the Congress and the, uh, you know everything, it turned out that I had been to 54, 55 of the 85 countries. Or I knew somebody who was there, or, or they had a consulate here. Or, but I said, we can do this. And it's amazing the way everybody came forward. Uh, Hugh McCall came in and he was being sued uh, for merging the banks by the NAACP and uh, I, I wrote him a note saying we need you in the Olympics and you come and help us with the Olympics and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll work this out with the NAACP. <laughs> uh, we need money and he, he agreed to be the first uh, sponsor and Billy said, that's $40 million. He said, well, it cost, cost me 
$90 million to put, change the name on this bank. I think I, we'll do better with helping the Olympics with $40 million. And I said, yeah, but we need $300 million to put a guarantee on the, the, the stadium and get started building that. And I don't want you to do it, but um, if you could get the other bankers together and maybe all together, you could guarantee us $300 million. And he said, don't worry, I'll take care of that. But that's the kind of response we got from everybody in Atlanta. Uh, we had very few people to turn us down. When we're in the presence of someone who's made history like Ambassador Young, I think we are going to take executive privilege here and let these three folks ask their questions, if that's okay with the Ambassador. I know you have a tight schedule, but I'm okay. um, we need your, your input, so Bob. Uh, Thank you, and what an honor to be in front of you today. I don't know in life uh, many people that solve big problems like you have, so I was wondering, how do you solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? You know, it would have been very easy, because it started in 1948, and we forget that, that Ralph Bunch won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1948 for setting up this potential two-state solution. Uh, and uh, we were, uh, Bernice, your daddy, wanted to get involved in that, and we were doing pretty good in Atlanta with tourism uh, in the 60s. We, we realized that one of the things that helps us get along is we keep bringing people in here and building new hotels and having conventions, and that's how we grow an economy. And so we dec he decided, that if we could take 4,000 pilgrims to Middle East and two, they couldn't stay on the same side, they'd have to open up the Mandelbaum gates and the American Jewish Committee worked with us and uh, I went to, to Israel in 1966 and w we had an agreement from the Jordanian Tourist Board and the Israeli Tourist Board to build an amphitheater around the Sea of Galilee. And Sandy Ray from Brooklyn was bringing a 100 boys choir from New York. And Martin Luther King was gonna preach from the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and we were gonna have hallelujah in the Holy Land. Uh, and the day I left, the first Egyptian jets were shot down. And that meant that we canceled the uh, we had to cancel the trip because the war was going on. So we were just a little too late. Uh, when I was at the UN, uh, once again, we were just a little too late because people, well people, for some people didn't want President Carter to help settle that, that situation, but he wanted to. And he wanted to get me involved at the UN, and I had meeting. Shimon Peres was former president of Israel. Uh, Moshe Dayan was the present foreign uh, secretary of Israel. Both of them came to see me at the UN to ask my help for bringing this issue before the UN. At the same time, the Palestinians were mobilizing with all of the Arab group to get me to uh, take it up at the UN in my month as the Security Council president in August of 1967 or something, well, whatever, 77. Uh, and uh, the State Department and the New York press panicked uh, because well, I don't know, um, but I ended up coming back to Atlanta uh, because w we have very good relationships between the black and Jewish community here and all over the South. And um, Rabbi Rothschild and Coca-Cola saved Martin Luther King's Nobel Prize dinner uh, and um, John Lewis organized the Black Jewish 
committee and, and, and we have worked together uh, on most of those issues here, but that's not the way it is in New York. And, and it, was, it got very volatile and hostile in New York. And so it was best that I came back here. But my opponent, when I ran for mayor, happened to be Jewish. And he was a good friend of mine. And I really think I got almost as many Jewish votes as he got. You know, but, but he, he was also kind of ill by that time. Uh, and, uh, but we could have settled it time and time again. Uh, but uh, it just, it hadn't happened. So, Ambassador Yang, I want to be respectful of your schedule, and I've been told by uh, Mr. Kumar, the president of your foundation, you have a meeting coming up soon. So we're going to go into the lightning round here. And David's going to ask this question to RK, and then if you are willing to stay around for a few minutes, I know folks would enjoy having a chance to get photo taken, but we'll need to be respectful of the ambassador's schedule. So, David, you're on. I like to think of you as the oracle of Atlanta, sir. Um, I've always seen you that way. Um, and you've told us that our future depends on our doing the same thing. I'm, worry, I'm wondering, when you see all the currents in the world these days, what worries you the most about Atlanta's future? What's the biggest hurdle you see in front of us? Everything worries me. <laughs> but in, in the final analysis, I fall back on Martin Luther King. You know, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet the scaffold sways the future, for behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. So just like I believe in this city, I believe in this nation. Uh, and I believe in the future of humanity. And yeah, we're going to have to worry about artificial in intelligence. But a friend of mine had an operation and they ran something up his thigh <laughs> and it went into his heart and it changed three different, four different, uh, what, what do you call it, heart valves and came out and he was out of the hospital in two days. Well, if that's artificial intelligence, I'm with that. <laughs> I hope I don't need it anytime soon. but. But yes, there is a lot frightening going on in the world, but everything frightening is equally hopeful. And I decide to keep my side with the people who are hopeful. Okay, we are on the clock now. We've got about 45 seconds, so you've got about 15 seconds for your question, and we've got a quick answer. Okay, so, uh, so Andy, my question to you is, you have done many good things for the city of Atlanta and the world. What is your legacy if you have to write? You know, I don't kind of believe in legacy. I mean, just, I mean, you are the legacy. We are the legacy. I'm your legacy. That none of this would have happened if, um, if we hadn't gotten to know each other. If you hadn't offered me a job, that's the other thing. I left the mayor's office and I was broke. Uh, and um, you, 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 you were trying, you were buying an engineering firm that had 32 offices in Africa. Uh, and nobody in the, either the London firm or here had been to Africa. So I got a job with you. And we, we could have done things with the Middle East, with Africa. We had more connections and, and we had skilled British engineers that just didn't know how to bid for projects and know how to collect the money. Uh, and so we were bringing an American uh, business model to a colonial model uh, and um, people back here didn't understand what was happening and they got suspicious and cynical and uh, that dream didn't fulfill itself. But, well, really, the, I mean, what we were planning to do was Kuwait, before that war, 
they give every male, when he becomes 21, he gets a $250,000 allowance. And he has to build a home, but in Kuwait. And they weren't building any homes in Kuwait. They were needing something like 15,000 homes a year, and they weren't building it. So actually, I got together with Newt Gingrich and others, and, and we had the Congress behind it. Um, well, with Kuwaiti and Arab money and American technology and, uh, you know, whoever made air conditioners, we're going to have to make air conditioners for 120 heat. Uh, and they were ready to do that. We had something like 300 American companies that were ready to do business in the Middle East uh, to stop the war. Uh, and, but the, the, the people who were making the decisions about uh, law engineering at that time uh, re really didn't have that kind of vision and uh, thought both of us were crazy. And we, it was crazy, but it could have happened. Thank you. Ambassador Young, thank you very much. It's a very <laughs>